Okay, we are live now. Uh, good evening, everyone. On behalf of Society for Research Alternatives, I welcome you all to this online discussion on translation. I am thoroughly pleased to introduce to you today's speaker, Mr. B. Ramaswamy. Uh, before leaving the virtual stage to him, let me introduce him shortly. V. Ramaswamy took up literary translation from Bangla to English of Voices from the Margins in 2005, following two decades of grassroots organize, organizing and social activism on behalf of the laboring poor of Kolkata. Three volumes of his translation of the short fiction of Shubhimol Misro, uh, The Golden Gandhi Statue from America, Wild Animals Prohibited, and this could have been Ramayan Chamar's uh, tale, two anti-novels have been published to critical acclaim. And the fourth is under publication. He has translated the novel, The Runaway Boy by Monoranjan Vapari. His recent publications include Memories of Arrival, A Voice from the Margins by Adhir Vishash, Life and Political Reality, two novelas by the late Shohidul Zahir of Bangladesh. He has been shortlisted for the Crossword Book Awards twice and was selected for the inaugural Literature Across Frontiers Charles Wallace India Trust Fellowship in Creative Writing and Translation at Aberystwyth University, Wales. Uh, so with this short introduction, uh, uh, you can uh, start, Ramada. It's over to you now. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Right. Uh, good evening, uh, friends. Um, thanks, first of all, to Society for Research Alternatives uh, for organizing uh, this program and to Shuparna in particular, who communicated with me about it. I'm glad to be here. Um, it, it occurred to me that uh, one way I could begin was by reading uh, the very first thing that I translated, the first three or four sentences, actually the first paragraph of a short story. So I'll uh, read that out uh, in, in Bangla and English simultaneously. So this is a story called Haran Majid Bidhoba Bower Mora Ba Shunar Gandhi Murti by Shubhimal Mishra. Haran Majid Bidhoba Bowtar Arkono Upai Chilona Golai Dori Die Morlo Baish Bachori Eto Mora Akon Tortor Kore Khaler Gola Jole Beshe Jatche Duto Kak अनेक खून धोरे देखे आस चिलो अकुन फिरे जाबो and the English uh, that I did for that Haran Maji's widow had no option slung a rope round her neck and died the bloated corpse of the 22 year old floated down the turbid waters of the creek Two crows had cawed for a long time. Now they would go back. So I, I, I did that uh, on uh, Dashomi day of uh, Durga Puja in 2005. You know. <coughs> Excuse me. So that, that was my uh, first... Uh, uh, attempt at, at translation and there were events leading up to that happening and and why I was translating uh, Shubhimal Mishra. I was also translating earlier this day in the morning. I like to wake up early in the morning and spend a couple of hours or so translating. Fresh morning air is very conducive. So I'd also like to read 
what I translated today, just one sentence. Unlike uh, what I read out earlier, which were four short sentences, this is one long sentence. So it is uh, from the novel Mukher Dike Dekhi by Shohidul Jahir of Bangladesh. Uh, he was born in 1953 and passed away prematurely in 2008, leaving behind a small body of work, but of exceptional uh, quality and uh, significance. So I read from Shohidul Johir, the novel Mukher Dike Dekhi. Fokrul Alam Othoba Unno Kauke Hoyto She Boleje Shudu Dud Kawanui Noa Koimontar Chele Lalon Palone Bhar Moholar Madur de Hate Chere De Nije Tonga Banaya Bachar Dandai Basto Hoya Thaki Tar Proman Chan Mir John Morpor Tagra Shori Thaka Shoteo Tar Nijer Buke Dud Moregele She Protome Gualar Kach Theke Dud Nite Shuru Kore Doya Gonj Kimba Jorpule Pani Tankir Kach Theke Dudwala Eshe Dud Dia Jete Thake Kintu Jaimatro She Bandor Guloke Visheshkore Dudwala Bandor Nitake Deke Take Omni tar buddhi gajai, she bandor ni take, kibhabe manage kore, ebong gualar dud neva chere dai. Chanmiya bandorini magna dud kaya boro hote thaki. Dityoto, koimon dekloje bandorwala utpat bandor gulo utpat kotche. Gore bithor kochi polata dike bandorini ta. Bishonno choke takaya thaki. Dake se bicholito deke se bicholito holo. Janlai porda lagalu. Pore janlar palao lagaya dilu. Kintu se dorjata amon babe raklo jate. Badurera. Shikol namaya. Gore dukte pari. Ebong. Jobeda rahman boli. Kemun Chalak Maya Lok Allah. And that I will uh, read out in English uh, translation. Uh, um, perhaps Khoimon. Uh, no, it's for Krul. Um, Perhaps she told Fokrul Alam or somebody else that it wasn't just the suckling and that Khoimon left the task of raising of her son's son to the monkeys while she was busy with her business of making and selling paper packets. And the proof of this was that after Chanmya was born, when the milk in her breasts dried up despite being healthy and robust, she began fetching milk from the milkman. But as soon as she observed the monkeys and especially the suckling one, she got the idea and somehow managed to make the female monkey comply. She stopped getting milk from the milkman and nourished by the breast milk of the female monkey, Chan Mia kept growing. Secondly, Khoimon observed that the monkeys were a nuisance. The female monkey kept gazing sadly at the little baby inside the room. Seeing that she was perturbed, she put up a curtain at the window. Later, she also shut the window. But she shut the door in such a way that the monkeys could open the latch and enter the room. And Zobeda Rahman said, Allah, what a cunning woman. Okay, thank you uh, for your patience. So this is the last uh, sentence I translated this morning. And earlier I read out the first paragraph uh, that I translated in uh, 2005. So it's been a 
15 and a half year journey uh, since then. Uh, and I have become a full-fledged uh, literary translator from Bangla into English. Uh, that's not uh, my profession or occupation. For my livelihood, uh, I manage my family's small business. Um, but uh, nowadays, most of my time is uh, devoted to translation. And I have a lot of work uh, piled up on my table, meaning books that I think I should translate. So I'll talk about this journey of 15 years. Uh, I began uh, translating and, and uh, began with Shubhimal Mishra entirely by accident. Um, in early 2005, I uh, met uh, a person, Mrinal Bose. He's a physician um, who lives in Shrodhpur. And uh, he also writes, uh, he, he's a novelist um, in English and Bangla. So I met him online by reading something that he wrote and his email was given in his article. So I wrote to him and thus uh, we began uh, exchanging emails uh, for several months. Um, and most of our discussions were of a literary nature, you know, about books and so on and writers. And uh, because he was a busy doctor, he didn't have time to meet. And then on August 15th of that year, which was a holiday, so I asked him whether he was free to meet. And we agreed to meet. And so I went up to uh, Shodhpur, where I picked him up. And then we drove to Barakpur. There's a famous bar there. Uh, and so we sat there and uh, started talking. And as a conversation opener, I asked him, you know, Tale ki achkal, meaning, what are you reading in Bangla? You know? And then he said, Dhur, shab rabish, parar motun ar kichui nahi. Meaning, it's all rubbish, uh, there's nothing worth reading. Uh, in Bangla anymore. So I was taken aback uh, by his response and I asked him, uh, um, meaning, uh, how can you say that uh, there must be at least uh, one uh, Bengali writer worth reading? So he thought for a moment and then he said, yes, uh, there is uh, someone. His name is Shubhimal Mishru. So I don't know uh, how or why, but I suddenly told him when he mentioned Mishra's name. I said, all right, I'll translate him. And then we carried on our bar activities and uh, other conversations. Uh, so it could have just been a, you know, stray uh, <laughs> comment uh, in an expansive moment uh, in a bar. But that was uh, not to be. Uh, Dr. Mrinal uh, kept at me, you know, he didn't let me go. And he said, you'll translate, so you must start. And then he sent me uh, Shubhimal Mishra's uh, telephone number. Shubhimal Mishra's books uh, carried his telephone number. So he had one of his books. He looked it up and sent that to me. And so I phoned uh, the author. and introduced myself and said, uh, I'm interested in translating his work. Where could I get uh, his books? Uh, so he directed me to a couple of places, uh, one on College Street and one uh, near Shobha Bajar. 
Uh, and uh, so I went there at once and uh, picked up as many books as were available over there. And on the way back, sitting in the car, I was just going through the pages of his books. Then I put them on my desk at home, uh, and that was it. They sat there for two months. And then on uh, Dashami day of Durga Puja, as I said earlier, in the afternoon I was just feeling uh, idle and restless and bored. So my eyes uh, wandered to that pile of books on my desk and I picked up um, his uh, collection of stories uh, called uh, Anti Golpo. Uh, Shongro Anti Stories Collection and uh, started reading the first story, which was Haran Maji, which I read the first paragraph of. So I read the story from beginning to end, and then I took out my notebook and pen and sat down and started uh, translating. You know, uh, funnily enough, uh, translating, how do you translate? Uh, so it's been an evolution in my case. So in the beginning, what I would do was uh, I would uh, transliterate the Bangla text into Roman. Uh, then I would type that Roman of the Bangla uh, into the computer and then have uh, that on the screen, the Roman Bangla, and uh, translate beneath that. Uh, so, I, so that I could read on the screen the Bangla. And since I didn't have a soft copy or a scanner or anything, or there were no mobile phone cameras in those days. so. I did the labor of uh, transliterating it into Roman and, and then typing that. So I did that for uh, some stories, maybe six or something like that. A a and then I started translating directly from the book into the uh, English translation in a notebook. And then I would type that into the computer and edit it and so on. Uh, that process continued until fairly recently. All my translation I did uh, by hand. Um, in 2016-17, I did a long uh, novel, which became uh, two novels, uh, in fact, three, a trilogy by Manoranjan Bapari. So uh, I have a, a pile of uh, notebooks, you know, uh, of my handwritten translation. And then uh, some two years ago, I moved to directly uh, translating in English on the computer while reading the Bangla, either from a book or a soft copy also on the screen. Um, you know, if you are translating, then uh, translation uh, involves a lot of nitty gritty, you know, letter by letter and word by word, and sentence by sentence. So this method of uh, translation, whether handwritten or whether transliterated or whether directly into the computer, and directly into the computer and what, what I write is almost the final draft. In fact, while reading out uh, this Shohidul Zohid except I observed that I had skipped one line. Uh, uh, so uh, that often happens. So Rereading it and comparing the original to the translation uh, is vital. And not just once, but repeatedly. So, yeah, so I was talking about uh, 
the method of translation. So that's how I began. Uh, and uh, Minal Bose kept uh, urging me uh, to carry on. A and every story that I completed of Shubhimal Mishra, um, I would phone the author and uh, tell him that I had completed and I would courier, courier a printout of the story to him and also email it to Rinal Bose and await his comments. So he was always uh, very positive and complimentary and uh, encouraging and sometimes often uh, critical uh, also in his comments. You know. So I grew to trust him because uh, he, he wouldn't stop short of uh, making critical comments. He wasn't just kind of patting my back or something. So I just started translation uh, with nothing in my head, uh, but obviously some kind of uh, output you have to think of. I published uh, some of the stories in uh, e-zines e on the internet, uh, but I was thinking of a book and also thinking uh, how many and which stories uh, would be there in the book. But he here I must just slightly uh, add that uh, I'm entering a translation from Bengali and I begin this with Shubhimal Mishra. So for me, Shubhimal Mishra was just a name that my friend Mrinal mentioned. It could have been any Ram, Sham, Yodu, Modu. Instead, it was Shubhimal Mishra. I mean, what a what a uh, freak occurrence, you know. So I didn't know who Shubhimal Mishra was, uh, and in the sixteen years that I've been translating him, I've learned more and more and more about him. Um, it was also required uh, for my work. But uh, I never read uh, Bangla uh, literature in Bangla. Never. It was not part of my life. All my reading was in English. I was an English medium product, you know. And, and before that, I'm not even Bengali. I, I, I'm... A, my mother tongue is Tamil, but I lived all my life in uh, Kolkata and was earlier in a Tamil uh, cocoon, uh, linguistic as well as social and cultural. And, uh, and then that opened up from the time I joined college and university. But it was only when I was about 24 years old when I returned to Kolkata after my studies and uh, started working here uh, and and also got involved in uh, in social activism and grassroots mobilization uh, against evictions of squatters and so on so so that really began my education in Bangla, uh, the language, uh, the society, the city, the people, uh, the culture, the history, the politics, everything. And by then I myself had become a political uh, being and had read a lot uh, about everything and, and why the reality that I was trying to uh, do something about in Kolkata on behalf of the squatters, why such a reality existed historically, economically, politically, and so on. So I had done all that study and thinking and so on. And uh, so I enter uh, the life of the city. Uh, so I'm embedded in the city and in that activity and all that. But as a Tamil uh, and, and as somebody who 
was coming into that activity from the outside. I had never participated in any uh, social or, or cultural or political uh, activities uh, prior to that. I was 24 years old then and was in very much in this English medium uh, self-centered kind of cocoon in my life. Um, so I entered and uh, 20 odd years of uh, being in that process. So yes, a lot of Bengalification uh, did take place uh, within me. But uh, much before that, uh, I got married. My wife is uh, Bengali. So uh, as a son-in-law of a large uh, Bengali family, um, I had that uh, entry. Uh, and uh, so this insider-outsider aspect, you know, you couldn't be more intimately inside the uh, Bengali middle class Hindu uh, upper caste um, private sphere. You couldn't be any more uh, intimate uh, with that sphere than as a Jamai, you know, or son in law. So I was insider, but I was not uh, Bengali, you know, and my Bhaira Bhai, my wife's sister's husband, he's also uh, not a Bengali, he's Gujarati. And our uh, father-in-law's name was uh, Rajin. Some of his friends used to call him Raja. So sometimes uh, my brother-in-law, Devin and I, when we went for Jamai Shushti to our in-laws house, uh, I would hum Mura Dujona Rajar Jamai. Anyway, so th this insider-outsider uh, aspect uh, which defined me uh, 16 years ago when I started translation. Um, I've been reflecting on translation and even a few days ago, I had to do some email interview for my publisher about a book that has just come out. Uh, so uh, this uh, insider outsider aspect uh, hit me and I wrote about it. That's why I mentioned so it was this person who who began uh, translation. I didn't uh, read uh, Bangla literature. I only had uh, elementary three years of uh, learning Bangla in uh, school. And then I left Kolkata and completed my education in uh, UP, what was then UP. It's now Uttarakhand. So I knew how to read and write Bangla. And by and by and by, uh, I became fluent uh, in speaking Bangla. But uh, I never read Bangla uh, or, or even uh, read a Bangla newspaper regularly. So it was not in my world. So it was because my friend Mrinal said, you must uh, translate Shubhimol. And he was pushing me, and uh, so I just did it, you know. A and then uh, it didn't stop at that. So I was just a translator, you know. Uh, and especially for an independent translator like me, meaning Nobody has commissioned me to translate anything. No publisher has asked me to translate anything. I think that I should translate something and then I do it. And uh, when that uh, translation uh, has proceeded and is in an advanced stage, then I communicate with uh, publishers and uh, seek to get it published. 
So how would I uh, be a independent translator if I wasn't a reader of Bangla literature? So here my, again, the insider-outsider aspect comes up. So you could call me as a kind of spy, you know, a literary spy or a cultural spy from somewhere else, from Mars or somewhere who's visiting um, West Bengal and now Bangladesh also, and uh, gathering information and keeping tabs and coming to conclusions and forming opinions and so on. So that has, uh, in short, uh, you know, defined uh, how I have uh, picked up works and come across works and so on. But it was only in the case of Shohidul Johir. Uh, I read out a little bit of that a little while back. It was only uh, in the case of Shohidul Johir that uh, I read, meaning Zohid was the first uh, Bengali writer that I read uh, for the sheer pleasure of reading. All the reading uh, that I did or do for my translation is uh, of a technical nature. I mean, I am a machine, and that is the work that that uh, machine is doing, like a digital uh, device would have a scanner, you know. So I am scanning the text and uh, comprehending it, and then uh, translating it. So. I'm like a machine in the sense that uh, I'm not uh, a Bengali reader or a writer in Bangla. But what I do have uh, when I do the translation is the language. So there's literature and there is language. Those are the two parts of uh, a text and its translation. So I deal with the language. Uh, so in my 37 years now, since I got immersed into the life and world of uh, Kolkata and Bengal, um, I've developed uh, some uh, capability to understand uh, when Bangla is spoken. So, though I am reading, it's actually, uh, I'm hearing it uh, in my mind and uh, understanding what that speech is saying or means with all its uh, subtleties and nuances and so on. So, my background uh, here, uh, has given me that uh, cultural and sociological and linguistic uh, familiarity to see and spot uh, various aspects of any speech or text. So I, I, I'm a language, but I'm a machine translator of Bangla, uh, something like that. Uh, but in the case of uh, Zahir, uh, I read, a friend recommended his name to me, and then I got uh, his books, and then I spent about uh, two weeks basically living in his books, uh, and, and I started translating him at once. So uh, that is literature and also language for the translation. But uh, before that, uh, and other than Zahid, um, that personal literary uh, attachment is not there. Meaning I read Zahid and I loved it from the first sentence. So uh, he, he had hypnotized me, you know. So, uh, but in other cases, so though I'm saying uh, I haven't read in Bangla, 
I have no literary understanding uh, of Bengali literature. But still, uh, I read literature all my life, uh, but in English and in English translation. So I have the love of literature. So even if I'm reading purely as a machine, um, that literary uh, faculty or being within me kicks in. And then I can appreciate. Uh, and uh, again, thanks to Mrinal Bose, who has been a kind of guide also into kind of, let's say, advanced uh, literary sensibility. I was quite uh, an amateur and ignorant, uh, but for his comments and so on. So, so this person, coming back to the beginning, this, this person uh, who had a language uh, faculty and no literary uh, background as far as Bangla literature was concerned. And he started translating Misra uh, without knowing who Misra was or what the significance of his name or writing is in Kolkata. As I said, I discovered that by and by. So, you know, translation um, uh, is a commitment, you know, so, somebody can just do it like uh, you go for a run occasionally or have a pizza occasionally or something. You can do a spot of translation occasionally and uh, it might even be very good, you know. Mm. But uh, translating on and on and on for a long time is something else. Uh, it, it's like uh, comparing uh, somebody who cooks well and occasionally invites his friends and feeds them and they compliment him on his cooking. So it's uh, like the difference between a person like that and somebody whose career is as a creative chef, you know. So his life is cooking and the other person occasionally cooks. Uh, and obviously no amateur cook can imagine uh, what being a professional chef, maybe in a big restaurant or a big hotel, uh, what that entails, the many millions of dimensions that that entails, and so on. So, though I didn't intend to enter this uh, pursuit of communic of uh, commitment, but that's how it it turned out uh, by and by, and step by step, and so on. I just began with uh, Shubhimal Mishra and then did some stories and shared it with my friends. And then that was it. Uh, I got caught up and busy with whatever else was going on in my life until that point. And then a few months later, again, I uh, immersed myself for a few days and translated some more stories. Like this, uh, between uh, 2005 and uh, 2008, uh, every so many months, uh, I would sit down and do some stories. And meanwhile, uh, a friend of mine, another writer, his name is Ruchi Joshi, um, he uh, recommended uh, me to the editor then of uh, Harper Collins, Kartika. And she, she took an interest and she was coming to Kolkata on work. So she met me and uh, uh, was very uh, encouraging, you know, and uh, open and said, because she had read some samples of my translation and said that they would like to translate it. And then some months later, the contract for that was sent to me. 
And now that the contract has come, uh, I have the binding to complete it. So in the once again, during the Durga Puja of 2008, I sat down to uh, polish up a couple of stories that I had done and uh, start translating two or three stories uh, that were on my list and which were incomplete. And I did that during those puja holidays. And uh, then my father-in-law, uh, who's critically ill, terminally ill, and he was in hospital uh, and uh, about to pass away. And all the family members, including me, were in the uh, reception lounge in the hospital. And I had taken along uh, the Shubhimal Mishra book and my notebook, and I was sitting and translating to while away the time, you know, and completed it. Uh, and I suppose my father-in-law passed away shortly after that. And then some months later, uh, I got my son, he was 14 years old then, uh, to help me type up what I had written in the notebook. And uh, then I sat down to polish and edit uh, 15 stories of Subimal that, that I had completed and sent it off to the publisher Harper Collins. Uh, that was in July of 2009. And the book came out uh, a year later. Um, so here I should emphasize that a very important part of uh, any uh, literary book production process is copy editing. And uh, I had the opportunity to work for a year uh, in a publishing company, Orient Longman that is now Orient Black Swan. So I was an assistant editor in the Calcutta branch. And I learned a lot and it's been invaluable through my life. And especially now when I'm producing books. Uh, so copy editor in the publishing company, uh, and especially when it comes to translation, you translate it from a language into English and it must uh, be attractive to read in English also. So the role of the copy editor in the publishing company is vital. So right from the beginning, I've been fortunate uh, to have good copywriters. And so the book, books have a certain quality. So I had completed the first book of uh, Shubimol and uh, Continued to do a little bit of uh, translation, you know, some couple of stories that I had read from his books uh, seemed interesting to me and I had translated them. And then I thought that I should apply for a translation residency, you know. So I just Googled writer residencies and uh, found several, among them uh, Sangam House. Uh, Sangam House is in Bangalore, and uh, since uh, 2006, I think, they've been, or 2008, uh, they've been uh, inviting uh, people to apply, and those who are selected have to come at their own cost uh, to Bangalore and go back at their own cost. But while they are there for three to four weeks, you're entirely looked after in terms of food and place to stay and so on. So that the whole day you can just concentrate only on writing. And the number of other writers and translators who are also there at the same time. So in the evenings, uh, you can talk to them and uh, build lifelong friendships and so on. So I applied for that uh, and I got selected and uh, I began on the second uh, Shubhimal Mishra book 
in that uh, residency. And I, I think I could say that it was that uh, experience and that residency in Sangam House that was in early 2011 that really uh, pushed me or pulled me into uh, literary translation. That basically means just sitting and translating for a long spell of time and day after day after day, every day. And I did that for three weeks in Sangam House. So it was like uh, kick, kick starting uh, the vehicle, the translation vehicle. So that happened and I returned from Sangam House uh, and I had a list of stories for the second book of Misra. And one after the other, I did those. And uh, so compared to the first book, that was uh, just something that I was doing, you know. Um, but in the case of the second book, it was a more serious and sustained and regular process. So by the middle of uh, 2012, I had completed the manuscript of uh, 22 stories or something. Uh, for the second book of Misra and submitted it to the publisher. And, uh, and then I had also earlier, or ongoingly, I was making lists of uh, Shubhimal's uh, short stories, or he called them anti-stories. I was making lists of uh, the stories to translate and compile which stories would be in which book and so on. So eventually the the design that emerged was that I was going to translate his uh, short stories uh, chronologically, right from the beginning of his writing life to the end of his writing life. Uh, he started writing in 1967 and his first book uh, was published in 1971 and this story Haran Maji uh, was written and published in 1969. So the first book was his early writing, so late 60s, early 70s. Second book uh, as it emerged was 70s and uh, 80s and uh, Initially, there were 22 stories, and then I took out uh, two stories and added five new stories. So it became uh, 25 stories uh, published in the 70s and the 80s. So that was uh, completed by me in uh, 2012. But the publisher took a very long time uh, for various reasons, and the book only came out in uh, 2015. And it was during that gap, I went for another residency, you know, uh, this time uh, to the US, uh, in New York, uh, not the city, but upstate uh, New York, near the town of Hudson, along the Hudson River. So this was uh, in that residency, I, I began translating more of Shubhimal Mishra for the third book. And then uh, just as I finished my residency, my son who was 21 years old, he passed away back in India. So I had to rush back to uh, India uh, and uh, And in the months following, uh, I uh, revised the manuscript of the second book. As I said, I removed two stories because those two stories were from the 90s. And I thought this should be only the 70s and the 80s. So, and I had done uh, more uh, stories while in New York. Uh, which uh, were published in the 80s. And so those were included. So 25 uh, stories 
and that manuscript was submitted in uh, November 2013, the revised manuscript. And the book came out in, um, I think, August of uh, 2015. And while uh, in New York, uh, I did these other stories of the 80s, but I also began uh, his anti-novel called Ashule uh, Eti Ramayan Chamarir Golpo Hoye Utte Parto. This could have become Ramayan Chamar Steel. So I did that. And then it emerged that that would be the third book. And so the third book would have this Ramayan Chamar anti novel and also another anti novel called Rong Jokhon Shaturki Korone Chinno, when color is a warning sign. So bo both of these anti novels, the author had asked me uh, first Ramayan Chamar. And then uh, some years later, also wrong Jokhon Shaturki Coronet Chinno. So I, I then devoted myself uh, in 2013 and 2014 to completing the third book, which was these two anti novels. And it was ready in early 2015. And though HarperCollins published the first two books and had verbally uh, communicated to me that uh, two more books uh, would also come out, which would complete the whole coverage of Shubhimal Mishra's short fiction body of work. But uh, for various reasons, uh, there, there was no response. Uh, and finally, in 2016, they told me that they won't publish that third book. Uh, and then there was a change in editor and so on. And a new literary editor came in in 2017. He was an old friend of mine. So he emailed me saying, do you have anything to submit? And so I had a ready manuscript uh, of two anti-novels. So that came out in early 2019. And once again, uh, I must mention here the copy editor role. Um, so the current uh, literary editor in HarperCollins is Rahul Soni. He was the one who did the two anti-novels book with me. So it was very rich, rich uh, partnership, you know. Uh, that process of copy editing. I've sent my manuscript, he has read it, and then uh, he suggests changes or he makes comments or queries on the margins. A and I read those and respond to them, either agreeing with him or disagreeing or giving him some background information and so on. So <coughs> on when you do uh, tracking, uh, on word, so you have these margins on the side. So the comments uh, on the margins became a whole thing in itself, you know, a dialogue. So it, as I said, it was very uh, ri rich process. So early 2019, uh, the third Shubhimal book comes out. And here, <coughs> excuse me, I must add that uh, I was doing much more th than being merely a translator, you know. Uh, I was learning for myself about Shubhimal Mishra and his writing uh, by speaking to people and reading uh, entirely in Bangla uh, and finding out about uh, publications and books and acquiring them and reading. And uh, Also, like an anthologist, you know, uh, if a writer has a, a body of work and you're going to bring out one or more volumes of that, how will you compile those volumes so they're not done at random? 
the, there's a design, uh, there's an aesthetic, uh, there's a calculation. Uh, so, so willy nilly, I was doing all that, uh, and uh, that process continued for second book, third book. What should it include? So, like the third book has these two anti novels which were written uh, in 1982 and 1984. In 1990, he also wrote another anti-novel and these three together are called the anti-novel trilogy of Shubhimal Mishra. And, uh, but the third one was not really amenable to translation. You know, it is so embedded in Bangla language and Bangla literature particularly. So there would be so much of uh, you know footnotes or references and notes and so on, uh, which would make it something like a scholarly work rather than a work of literature. And the Bengali reader, when he or she reads it in the original, they are not reading a scholarly work. They are reading what they think is a piece of literature. Because they are embedded, uh, they can comprehend. Or maybe they can't, in which case they drop the book or they could educate themselves. You know. Shubhimal Mishra uh, is not for everyone. He demands a lot on the part of his reader. Uh, and uh, one has to uh, rise in various ways to be able to engage with his writing meaningfully. And so uh, I had to go deeper and deeper and further and further in those senses as well, doing much more than uh, translation. But in the process, growing, you know, in every way, uh, in various ways. So finally, uh, the fourth book of uh, Shubhimal Mishra. Uh, so I wanted right from the late 60s to 2012, when he stopped writing, he, he fell ill uh, in 2012 and his eyesight was failing. So he, he stopped writing. So about 45 years uh, of writing. And uh, he wrote only in little magazines and uh, nowhere else. Uh, he didn't write for any mainstream magazine or publication um, or for any major commercial publishers. He only wrote in little magazines and then he compiled his writings from those magazines and made books which he produced himself. He sat with the printer and the binder and then carried those books to his own house and then carried the books from his house to the book fair in the little magazine pavilion and sat with his bundle of books and directly spoke to his readers uh, who came looking specifically for him. Uh, so he, he became synonymous with the book fair for some people. Uh, and book fair meant Shubhimal Mishra. And they came to the book fair only to meet him and see what new books he has and buy them. So the fourth book, I tried to bring together his writings in the 1990s uh, and the 2000s, the first decade of the 20th century. So two decades. And uh, that list kept uh, becoming shorter and longer. Uh, I remember in 2016, uh, I invited uh, Mrinal, who lives in Shodhpur, uh, to spend a night in my house in Kolkata uh, with the intention that we would both uh, go through the Shubhimal Mishra texts and select uh, stories for the fourth volume. But that was 2016. But earlier in 2015, I went for another residency. Uh, this was in uh, Korea. Uh, there, there's a residency 
uh, founded by a very great and famous uh, writer of South Korea called Pak Kyung Ni. Um, she wrote a novel called Toji, which means land, Jomi. And she wrote it over a period of 25 years. Uh, so it was a multi volume work uh, with volumes coming out over 25 years. And when it was done, uh, she dedicated the uh, royalty from that uh, huge novel uh, to a foundation that she set up, Toji Foundation. And Toji Foundation invites writers from Korea and across the world to spend uh, one month uh, staying there, fully looked after, and just uh, write or paint and so on. Writers and artists are invited. So I, I went there in 2015 um, and began my work on the fourth Shubhimal Mishra book and uh, advanced uh, considerably and uh, because I was uh, approaching the end of the Shubhimal Mishra project of four books, I was thinking ahead of what I would do uh, after this, which writer I would translate. Um, and on Facebook, I uh, came across the name of uh, Manoranjan Vyapari. He was not on Facebook then. But on his behalf, uh, one of his associates um, used to uh, write about him. Uh, and so I had read that. And then I contacted the author and asked whether I could translate his autobiography. Uh, it's called Itibritte Chondal Jibon, uh, which in the Facebook post I had read about uh, and learned about it. So I was keen to translate. But he said that is already being done by somebody else, uh, Shipra Mukherjee, um, who teaches in the West Bengal State University in Barasat. And then subsequently, he gave me a Chondal Jibon. Um, it's an autobiographical novel. And uh, it was published uh, in a magazine from Bordoman. Um, in four parts. So he gave me the first two parts. They had been bound together in one volume. So I thought it was one single novel, one book. But that was uh, about 250,000 words long, um, which is too long for a single book. So and then there were two more parts, as I said. Uh, so it became a three part novel, the Chandal Jibon trilogy. So he gave me this uh, book. And so the first uh, literature across frontiers, Charles Wallace uh, India Trust Fellowship, was announced uh, then. And a friend, uh, prodded me to apply, though I was cynical and not really keen on applying because you apply and you fail. But she prodded me and I applied and uh, wonder of wonders, I was selected. I had proposed uh, Chandal Jibon and taken the consent of the author to propose it. And uh, I was in uh, Wales for three months. Uh, in three months, I translated, I think, um, something like uh, 100 and, 170,000 words out of the 250,000 words. And the remaining uh, 80,000 words took me eight months to complete, you know. So that's uh, telling. Uh, illustration of the benefits of a residency. You just sit and work the whole day and day after day, and week after week and month after month. So you get a huge amount of work done. And translation is only work, it's only labor. So when you translate a long novel like Chandal Jibon, 
it's like asking somebody okay start walking towards delhi i'm going there by air i'll see you there it's like an endless uh, venture you know just go on and on and on so but but if you are a serious uh, translator and you are going to go on translating it is compulsory to go through that experience of long and continuous labor you know it's a vital stage uh, translation is also a kind of uh, sadhana so uh, and sadhana involves a lot of uh, trials and tribulations so uh, that, that arduous labor is a essential and vital part of the life journey of a translator so the uh, shubhimol project was interrupted you know by the manoranjan bapa he gave me the manuscript and this fellowship came up and i applied and i was selected so shubhimol project was put on pause uh and i took this up and uh, completed the work in 2018 and finally a publisher sent me an agreement in 2020 uh, by then i got back to shubhimol and completed the fourth, fourth book and in march of 2021 i submitted the uh, manuscript so that has uh, i think 22 stories uh, of misra from the 90s and 2000s earlier in the third book beside the two anti novels i also uh, translated a, a essay by him um, which is like a manifesto it's about the anti novel uh, what is an anti novel and why is he writing that and what's his perspective so it's like a manifesto so i translate that and that accompanies uh, the two anti novels uh, i think it it's, it's comes in as an introduction so that makes the book uh, even more valuable uh, to a serious uh, reader so yes uh, i mentioned uh, manoranjan bapari so the chandal ji chandal jibon became chandal jibon trilogy of three novel the first one uh, volume was called the runaway boy that was published about a year ago and uh, the second volume called uh, the nemesis was supposed to come out later this month but uh, on the 1st of february uh, amazon which owns westland publisher announce the closure of westland so i suppose the runaway boy stocks uh, will be pulped uh, closure is supposed to be on 31st march i think so we have february and march uh, for those novels to be sold otherwise they'll be destroyed the second book was supposed to come out uh, this month it won't come out and the third book i was about to start work on it on the 1st of february when i came across the news of the closure so i didn't uh, do it but i had lost interest in that project you know um for various reasons and uh, i was un- reluctant to, to do the third volume so it was just as well i felt f- freed and liberated to get time Uh, on my hands to do something else so now right now i'm uh, very hectically trying to keep myself busy and finish something by march uh, instead of the bapari book so i've been very fortunate uh, to find uh, publishers uh, who are uh, supportive and to have copy editors uh, who uh, enhance uh, the creative work and uh, yeah i'll take a break now i'd be happy to answer questions and so on 
uh, I could go on and on. I thought I should give a Thank you so much uh, for sharing your unique journey with us. Uh, we have uh, one question in the chat box. Uh, uh, Mohammed uh, Samaun Kabir ask, uh, asked, uh, would be pleased if uh, please focus some light on the profession in translation and its prospect. Thank you. Uh, would you like to comment on this? Yes, uh, yes, I, I didn't uh, mention that, but uh, uh, it's not easy to um, have your livelihood as a translator uh, because you need the 12 months in the year and uh, if you have to support a family or contribute your share to a household as a translator uh, uh, it's not certain that so somebody goes to college and gets a degree or or studies engineering or management, and goes for placement and interview and gets a job. Uh, and the job is uh, a new kind of learning ground and whatever you might have learned in college or business school may not be so relevant. You've got to prove yourself in the job and rise. Uh, but at least uh, for that kind of uh, scenario, somebody entering it, with purpose and ambition, they have some picture uh, in front of them of how they can go through their career. Translation, uh, you might want to do it and you might start doing it, uh, but uh, will it be published? Uh, even after it is published, uh, how widely is it read? How well is the work received by critics? Is it at all noticed by critics at all? Is, is it at all uh, reviewed or discussed? A and uh, if you publish uh, one book, and then what about the subsequent book? And how much do publishers pay for translation? And uh, especially if you are uh, an independent translator, you're not uh, going after bestsellers. You're not a commercial minded uh, translator, but you are casting a critical eye on the literature sphere. And you think that there are these writers whose work is very valuable, but they haven't been translated. It's vital that they be translated for other people in India to know their name, for people in other countries to know their name. Just like we know the name of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and Murakami and so on, people should know the names of our writers also. So, uh, English language publishing is a strange kind of world which uh, exists in a hyperspace that is nowhere really or everywhere. So uh, there may be a very famous uh, Bengali writer and a very famous book of his and that is going to be, tra you are translating that into English, but you have to pitch it, pitch it to a publisher sitting most probably in Delhi. Um, it's like pitching Tagore and Gora or something. You know, so you feel so dejected. I mean, what's what's the point doing this? I mean, why do you have to pitch so and so writer and so on? But you have to do it. Uh, there's a procedure, and uh, they are ignorant. Uh, and uh, but uh, so the merit that you see or people see in a work in Bangla, uh, you have to convince them that uh, it has merit in English translation and what that merit is and why that writing is important and so on. So this pitching, pitching process is uh, important, but 
who knows whether it will be successful or not who knows how much they will pay so long ago i read uh, some interview with a mexican writer um, he was asked what advice do you have for aspiring writers he said you want to be a writer okay go and get a job do anything maybe open a shop so that you don't have to depend on your writing for your livelihood do whatever you have to do and write and write because you want to write i would think translation also like that you do whatever you have to do so that you can uh, live your life uh, but try and make time for translation and do it and it grows and it grows uh, and obviously if it's growing in you then what is coming out of you is also wonderful and rich and that will at some point also attract some money you know in terms of payments from public and so on. so yes it is possible to earn your livelihood as a translator but not right away if you begin it may take 10 or 15 years for you to reach a level where you can just keep on translating and the payments will also keep on coming and you can support yourself with that payment but uh, you can't enter into translation with the notion that i'm going to derive my livelihood from that suparna uh sorry my network is very unstable uh uh yes i i finished what i had to say yeah yeah uh, actually i i have uh, i have some observations i was uh, reading your life and political reality uh, so i i uh, saw that you um, kept a lot of uh, conversations in uh, bengali the you know the transliterated uh, bengali form uh, so uh, why did you um, did this and what uh, was the your right. intention yeah yeah uh, you know uh, one um, area where i completely fail as a translator i have no idea what to do that is is in dialect um so when you're reading in bangla so the speech the direct speech can be in shuddha bangla or it could be in one of any number of dialect S- sitting in kolkata we forget that west bengal also has large number of dialects And the moment you go out to the small towns and the district and the villages you will hear them you know so and also in bangladesh perhaps bangladesh the dialects are more alive than they are in west bengal uh, we tend to have a kind of relentless homogenization of speech happening in uh, west bengal towards shuddho bangla which is actually uchcho borno bangla also but uh, not so in uh, bangladesh so when you have dialect what do you do with it when a bengali reader is reading the text where some of the direct speech is in dialect some of the other is in shuddho bangla so h- how does the reader in bangla engage with it so the dialect is not shuddha bangla it's the dialect so it has a place it has a location root you know um, it, it is real uh, and uh, it pertains to a region 
pertains to a culture, to a language, to a sensibility in the people, to a historical past, um, to a geographical uh, reality, like for instance, it may be a drought prone region, you know, like Purulia, you know. So all those are embedded within that dialect, no? Those are the resonances uh, in the ears and mind of the Bangla reader. But uh, all that you can do in English is translate that dialect speech, what he is saying in that dialect. But the quality of that speech, the humorousness of it, the pungency of it, the funniness of it are all lost on the English reader, you know. So, so one uh, solution that I thought of uh, to deal with dialect was to uh, transliterate it in Roman and reproduce it, uh, bits of it. Um, what purpose does it serve? So when a Bengali knowing uh, reader reads it in English, he or she would recognize the dialect in Bangla. And that dialect obviously differs from the Shuddha Bangla that he or she knows. So they recognize it as dialect. They're amused by it. Uh, they find it uh, funny or they find it whatever. Uh, and or they enjoy the pungency of it. Or they laugh at a pun that is contained in it. So the reader in English who knows a little bit of Bangla or has friends who speak in Bangla, so he half knows Bangla. So that reader will discover that there are many Banglas, you know. He's seeing in the transliteration a Bangla that he can't relate to because it's a dialect unless he specifically knows Borishali or Dokhni. Uh, it doesn't mean anything to him. And yeah. uh, also to the foreign reader, it gives some feel and sound of of the uh, of the dialect. So that's the sound only of reason. the dialect. Yeah. No, I was um, in this uh, regard. I was also uh, thought, thinking about this that uh, while as you translate into English, uh, do you uh, keep in mind the readership that? Uh, is it for Indian readers or for foreign readers? Uh, do right. you keep so, in mind? The, uh, not consciously, but unconsciously it's there. Uh, so when I translate, my ideal uh, reader is a Bangla knowing English reader. That's the first. Second is a Indian reader who is in, in English reader who is Indian. So there's something in common between Indian and Bangla, you know, so culture, society, politics, history. Um, and thirdly, for the non Indian uh, reader, uh, so if it is entirely for the non Indian reader, for somebody in the UK or the US, then some further editing would have to be done. So two of my Shubhimal Mishra books have come out in US edition. So they had to be copy edited again, you know, to Amer Americanize the English translation um, or, or remove the Bengali uh, wherever it has been pushed in, you know, or, or diluted or something like that. So, yeah, but th th that is a dilemma for somebody translating an Indian Bhasha into English. Who is the reader? Right. Is it an Indian? Is it a Bengali? Is it a Punjabi? Is it a South Indian? Is it a Bangladeshi? Is it a Pakistani? Is it a German? Or is it an American or Australian? Is it an English reader in Australia, New Zealand, England, America, Canada, Asia or Africa? Where? All the Englishes are not the same. You know. Right. Uh, and they have local. So just like there is Hing 
Hinglish, Hindi and English combined. So similarly, there are so we have Bangli. Yeah, you have several Englishes in Africa also. You know, in West Africa, in East Africa. So uh, yeah, it's difficult. It's it's, it's difficult to make up your mind uh, who is your reader. You know, because uh, it can't be one thing for all. And in translation and publishing and in the hegemony uh, that exists in the publishing world of languages and power and all that, so uh, there's a tendency of homogenization. Whereas uh, there should be heterogeneity, you know, because language is heterogeneous, culture is heterogeneous. Uh, so actually. Yeah, actually, someone has uh, posted a comment. Onimesh Roy has said that, uh, sir, it is so generous of you that you have accepted the fact that the word shuddho is Brahminical in nature. Uh, the truth is that every dialect is shuddho. Uh, yes, and it's not a dialect; it's a bhasha. Yeah, right. Or the word, say... and the concept of dialect is itself problematic. Right, but but I like the Bangla word bully. Yeah, it's like little language or small language yeah. or, or yeah. speech, but it doesn't just demean it. like we have parol and lang. Yeah, the concept so of I think the word bully to my mind, I may be wrong, is not demeaning, uh, yes. it's uh, it's affectionate, uh, so, right? So, so you can say borishali bully mm -hmm. or bhasha, right? Uh, but it's not a dialect and. Uh, Hindi has consigned uh, so many languages to dialect, but they're not languages. They're not dialect. They're full-fledged languages, whether it right. is Maithili or Bhojpuri or uh, or uh, series of uh, languages in North India, like with the river flowing from the Himalayas to Bengal. Language is also flowing. You know? Just right. just before Bangla is Maithili. And you can hear the similarities between them. Uh, actually, again, there Maithili is Maithili is similar to the Hindi language. So Maithili uh, is like a bridge, you know. Actually, there is a uh, shairi or poem like Kos Kos Me Badle uh, Boli. No. Uh, yes, so yes. Uh, uh, another comment by Mohammed Samaun Kabir. Uh, thank you, sir, for your insightful response to my previous query. Uh, how to differentiate between Tumi and Tui? No, <laughs> you can't. That's a practical can't. question. <laughs> and not only Tumi and Tui, if a writer. Apni. Has, there is also has, Apni. If a writer has used Sadhu uh, Bhasha uh, of the old. Uh, Bonkim type, right? right. Suppose, uh, suppose a writer uses that uh, Shadu Bhasha of the Bonkim variety in one paragraph, is written entirely in that Bhasha, and in subsequent paragraph is in uh, Cholti Bhasha. So he has chosen to use these two registers. Right. How will you distinguish these two registers in English? Uh, it's difficult. So uh, sometimes I overlook tu, tu or tui or tumi because it's not so relevant. Uh, sometimes I bring in other words. So uh, when a babu uh, is climbing on a cycle rickshaw and tells uh, jabi, so that's a sociological phenomenon, you know. Right. The person driving it may be an old man, and right. a young man is telling the old man Jabi. So that's class and sociology and discrimination, all that is the background. Yeah. But uh, so in English, I'd say boy. You know, in, in, in American uh, literature, this boy is used as an offensive word, you know. It's like a white man calling a black man boy. You know, showing right. him his place. That's what the Babu is doing with the Rikshawala also. He's calling an old man boy. So I'll use devices like that uh, to convey the sociological aspect. Um, and at the other extreme, I let it pass because it's not material in that sentence or in that story. You know, 
it's just language but you have to be creative i don't yeah. make any policies or rules i encounter it and i make a solution at that moment each time which may be different from the solution i used in the past or the same but you have to be alive to all these dimensions at all the time and react to it according to your decision at that point when you encounter yeah. the choice of the translator that is the final thing and uh, bharati annadam annadanam uh, commented thank you sir for taking us on the journey of translation through your life and works uh, yeah so there okay. are no, uh, no more questions here and uh, i i i would like to ask one more thing uh, so uh, as tamil is your uh, mother tongue so do you plan to translate from tamil no 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 my no. Uh, knowledge of uh, tamil uh, understanding spoken writing everything is uh, uh, insufficient for that and some years ago i went to tamil nadu i need to go there occasionally nowadays so i was there some years back and it occurred to me that i could live here and become more fluent in the language and grow to know more but i will never ever have the kind of confidence and command that i have sitting here in west bengal about my society culture language you kind of know you know yeah. like you have right. x-ray eyes you have x-ray yeah. eyes you have x-ray ears <laughs> you know so uh, ju just one word used by somebody can conjure up a whole uh, story uh, which is historical or something that kind of sociological cultural uh, uh, depth i i would never uh, achieve uh, in tamil nadu unless i spent my whole life there right. but uh, but uh, this question of the translator being embedded in a culture and society Uh, living uh, is, I think, fundamental uh, to the act and creative act of translation. But there are people who have no uh, embeddedness, who in fact translate from three or four languages into English. Uh, they just know the words. Uh, like a tourist where is the toilet where is the passport office can you show me the taxi so like stock of phrases so uh, right you may you, you you may be able to understand actually you can't uh, but catch the in, in depth yeah just knowing words thing. knowing words uh, and understanding uh, having a rudimentary understanding of the language uh, is inadequate uh, that's how i uh, see it and i would like uh, translators uh, to engage with translation like that from their embeddedness you know right uh, so, uh, uh, another question uh, Muhammad Samaun Kabir have another question. Uh, what does a translator translate actually, sir? Is it the language or the culture? I mean, what is at the center? Uh, thank you, sir. Yes, everything. Right. Everything. You you have to translate everything. You cannot cannot separate language from culture. No. And society and history and politics yeah, and everything. Yeah. Everything. Uh, so we have come uh, we don't have any more questions so okay then thank you As so I much said, i have yeah. to cook yeah yeah right thank you so thank, much for thank joining you all. thank yeah, you for yeah. your patience so we are ending the broadcast then and thank you also the participants who listen yes, to us patiently much. yeah 
ओके आई एम एंडिंग द ब्रॉडकास्ट थैंक यू बाय बाय